Perfect. Thank you for the invitation to present. Today I'll be talking about astrocyte oligodendrocyte interaction regulating central nervous system remyelination. So in the central nervous system, damage to myelin, termed demyelination, leads to nerve dysfunction and or loss. And this is observed in numerous neurological disorders, including multiple sclerosis, as we've just heard about. Fortunately, the myelin can be regenerated in a process termed remyelination, which involves first the recruitment and proliferation of progenitor cells, followed by their differentiation to mature oligodendrocytes, which then make the new uh, myelin, which can restore nerve health and function. However, we know that remyelination often fails with disease progression, so it's important to understand the mechanisms that support healthy and failed remyelination. Although the work in my lab has uh, historically focused on how microglia support remyelination, we became interested in the astrocyte, which is the most abundant glial cell type in the CNS and has been shown to become reactive following demyelination. However, the role of astrocytes in remyelination is unclear and controversial. They've been shown to both support and inhibit uh, progenitor cell proliferation, oligodendrocyte differentiation, and remyelination itself. So Irene Molina Gonzalez, uh, when she joined the lab, was interested in understanding how astrocytes regulate remyelination and the molecular pathways that control their function. So the first thing that Irene did was to delineate the astrocyte responses during efficient remyelination. And she did this by using a model where she stereotactically injects the myelin toxin LPC into the white matter tract, the corpus callosum of the adult mouse. And this model is useful in that we have a temporal separation between the demyelination and the subsequent remyelination, such that we can look at the regenerative responses of astrocytes in isolation of damage. And we have a very clear delineation of oligodendrocyte lineage cell responses over time, such that we know that three days post-injection, the progenitor cells are recruited and proliferating. At seven days post-injection, the oligodendrocytes are starting to be generated. And by 14 days post-injection, we have a remyelination that started. And so Irene looked at the reactivity of astrocytes using GFAP as a marker. And here we're looking at the corpus callosum that's outlined in white. And compared to the no lesion control, you can see over the course of remyelination, we have an increase in astrocyte reactivity. This is quantified here, looking at the GFAP positive cells. And compared to the no lesion control in black or the sham control in gray, which is stable over time, you can see that we have an increase in astrocyte reactivity really starting when the oligodendrocytes are starting to be generated, and then it decreases once remyelination is complete. And importantly, Irene confirmed this with other markers of astrocyte reactivity. So Irene was then interested in understanding how these changes in astrocyte responses during remyelination is influencing their function, how they're regulating remyelination. And she did this by doing trap sequencing to look at the trans translatomes of astrocytes during remyelination. And she did this by using a transgenic mouse in which we have astrocyte specific expression of a ribosomal subunit that's tagged with a GFP. And this is because it's driven by the ALDH1 L1, uh, ALDH1 L1 promoter, which is a pan astrocytic gene. And here we have GFP tagging of the ribosome subunit, or RPL10A. And so then what we can do is, by affinity purification, isolate out the ribosomes in the astrocytes based on GFP, and then sequence the RNAs that are associated with this ribosome. And here what I'm showing on the right is that with the trap isolation, we can have enrichment of astrocyte-associated genes. We're looking at the log two-fold change of the trap uh, mRNAs compared to the total input without the trap. And you can see that we have an enrichment of astrocyte-associated markers and not those associated with neurons, oligodendrocytes, microglia, or endothelial cells. So we then looked at the transatomes of astrocytes at these different time points, these key time points during remyelination at three, seven, and 10 days post-injection. And here we're looking at the gene expression changes with the upregulated genes in red and the downregulated genes in blue. And what we found was that the transatomes were dynamically changing during efficient remyelination, such that the genes that were regulated were different at every time point. So to better understand how this translatome change uh, reflected the function of astrocytes, 
Irene performed pathway analysis, and what she found was that at this early time point of three days post-injection, the astrocytes had an enrichment of the NRF2 pathway, which has been shown to be antioxidant and neuroprotective. So here on the right, we're looking at NRF2 target genes. Uh, this is a heat map looking at log 2 fold change versus our no lesion control. And we can see that three days post-injection that the astrocytes have enrichment or activation of these um, NRF2 target genes. This then down-regulated at seven days, as here we're looking at a heat map of seven versus three days post-injection, and you can see that these NRF2 target genes have gone down. This has been validated here at the protein level. We're using HMOX1 as a marker uh, of an NRF2 target gene, and you can see that compared to the no lesion and sham control, that at three days post-injection, we have GFAP positive astrocytes in green that are expressing HMOX1 in purple. This is quantified here. We're looking at the double positive cells that are HMOX1 and GFAP positive. And compared to the no lesion control or the sham control, you can see in green here that we have an upregulation of these double positive cells at three days post injection. So we're seeing uh, the astrocytes show a transient enrichment of the NR2 pathway early during remyelination. Irene then did pathway analysis at the later time point of seven days post injection. And here she found that there was an upregulation of the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. So here we're looking at the heat map of genes that are involved in the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. And you can see that these are engaged at, in the astrocytes at seven days post-injection. We then also did some data mining of astrocyte translatomes in EAE, this autoimmune mediated demyelination model where we know that remyelination is very poor and where Rhonda Vosco's lab very nicely showed that cholesterol biosynthesis is decreased. And indeed, we do see that uh, the genes that we see are up during efficient remyelination are down during poor remyelination. We found that these genes were up at seven days versus three days, as shown in the heat map here. So this was validated um, by looking at an enzyme involved in cholesterol biosynthesis, the HMGCS1, and compared to the no lesion and sham controls, you can see that at seven days post-injection that we have HMGCS1 expression in purple in the astrocytes here in yellow. And this was quantified here, looking at the double positive cells, HMGCS1 positive, GFAP positive, and compared to the no lesion and the sham controls, at seven days post-injection, you can see that we have this increase in the double positive cells. So interestingly, we're seeing that the astrocytes show this enrichment of the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway at a time when we know new oligodendrocytes are being formed. So we're seeing this transient increase in the NRF2 pathway, which decreases, and at the same time, we see engagement of the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. And we became interested in how these pathways might communicate with each other, because it's been shown that in the liver, when the NRF2 is downregulated, you have a boost in the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. And we were wondering whether this is what happens during remyelination in astrocytes as well. And so we asked what happens if we don't turn off the NRF2, but rather it's sustained in astrocytes. And Irene addressed this by using a mouse in which we have NRF2 that's overexpressed in astrocytes as this is driven by GFAP. And this mouse has been used numerous times um, to look at the role of NRF2 in astrocytes in a number of different neurological conditions. Here we confirmed by sequencing the astrocytes in the GFAP and NRF2 mouse compared to the wild type astrocytes that we do indeed have upregulation of the NRF2 pathway as the genes uh, downstream of NRF2 are activated. And here we're looking at the protein level, looking at HMOX1, a downstream target of NRF2, and showing that compared to wild type control in the GFAP and NRF2 mouse, we have HMOX1 that's increased in the GFAP positive cells. So we're using this GFAP and RF2 mouse, and the first thing we asked was whether the astrocyte responses are altered. So uh, what we did was look at GFAP, the reactivity of astrocytes, and as you'll remember, at 7 and 14 days in the wild-type control is when we see that we have an increase in astrocyte reactivity. But in the GFAP and RF2 mouse, we found that this was delayed. So we had a decrease in reactive astrocytes present at 7 days, and this did eventually recover by 14 days, but it was delayed. So this is quantified here, looking at the GFAP positive cells, no difference in no lesion controls, but you can see that compared to the wild type in gray, where we have an increase in reactivity over time, this was delayed in the GFAP and RF2 mouse. 
We then looked at the impact of sustained NRF2 in astrocytes on activation of the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway in the astrocytes. We did this at seven days when, uh, as you'll remember, it's when we have our peak in our cholesterol biosynthesis pathway activation in the astrocytes, shown here by HMGCS1 expression in purple in the GFAP positive cells in yellow. And we found that in the GFAP and RF2 mouse, we had an impairment in activation of the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway in the astrocytes. And this is quantified here, looking at the, GFAP, uh, sorry, the HMGCS1 positive cells that are GFAP positive compared to the wild type control when NRF2 sustained in astrocytes, you can see that this is decreased. So what's the consequence of uh, these altered uh, uh, astrocyte responses on remyelination? So we looked at this by looking at a myelin protein, MVP. First, when we looked in the no lesion control, you can see that compared to the wild type, the GFAP NRF2 mouse does myelinate normally. Then we looked at 14 days post-injection when we start having robust remyelination in the wild-type mouse, and you can see that we do have some remyelination that's taking place. But in our GFAP and RF2 mice, you can see that this is impaired. So this was quantified by looking at the percentage MVP area. No difference in the no lesion controls, but compared to our wild-type control with the GFAP and RF2 mouse, this was impaired. So the sustained NRF2 activation in astrocytes impairs remyelination. Irene then asked, what's the uh, reason behind this impaired remyelination? So she looked at the oligodendrocyte lineage. And she did this by using CC1 as a marker of mature oligodendrocytes, and OLIG2 is a marker of the entire oligodendrocyte lineage. So by looking at the double positive cells, what Irene found was that at 14 days, there was a decrease in the number of mature oligodendrocytes in the GFAP and RF2 lesions compared to the wild type control. She then asked whether this was a result of impaired differentiation of oligodendrocytes. And she did this by looking at the proportion of the oligo 2 lineage that was either mature CC1 positive or immature CC1 negative. And she found that whether she was looking in the no lesion controls or at 14 days post injection, that there was no difference between the genotypes and the proportion of the cells. And so there was no impact on differentiation. So what Irene did was look at an earlier time point and looked at the apoptosis of oligodendrocytes by looking at cleaved caspase 3 expression in the oligodendrocyte lineage. And what she found was that at seven days post-injection, that compared to the wild-type control, there was an increase in the number or percentage of apoptotic oligodendrocytes. So this shows that astrocytes support remyelination by promoting the survival of mature oligodendrocytes. And to do this, they need to downregulate NRF2. So then we hypothesized that we could rescue the impairment of remyelination and the impact on oligodendrocytes in the GFP NRF2 mice by stimulating the cholesterol pathway, which we saw was not properly engaged. And so we did this by using a small molecule, CS6253 which is an ABCA1 agonist that's been previously used in EAE and shown to enhance the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway in astrocytes in EAE. And so Irene applied this starting at seven days post-injection when we know that the cholesterol pathway is normally engaged in wild-type astrocytes, but when this is impaired in the GFAP and RF2 astrocytes. And so what Irene saw first was that we had an increase in the HMGCS1 positive astrocytes with application of the drug compared to the PBS control. And then she found there was a rescue on the oligodendrocyte. So looking in the GFAP and R2 mouse and looking at the CC1 positive mature oligodendrocytes in purple that are also oligo 2 positive, that with the CS6253, there was a rescue of the number of mature oligodendrocytes compared to the PBS or no treatment controls. So we're seeing that stimulating the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway can rescue oligodendrocytes when are NRF2 sustained in the astrocytes. So the next thing that Irene did was then ask about the translational relevance of her findings. She looked in a human MS tissue, where here we're looking at a tissue block where the myelin has been stained for Luxol fast blue in blue. And in red, we've been able to digi digitally map the lesions shown here outlined in red. And we're able to look at different types of MS lesions that have different remyelination potential, where we know that active lesions have high remyelination potential and inactive lesions have low remyelination potential. 
So the first thing Irene did was to look at activation of the NR2 pathway by using HMOX1 as a marker in purple and looking in GFAP positive cells. And what she found was that compared to control and active lesions, that the inactive MS lesions had an increase in these HMOX1 positive astrocytes. Now this was quantified here by looking at the proportion of GFAP positive cells that are HMOX1 positive and compared to control or fully remyelinated lesions or active lesions, the inactive lesions had higher uh, proportions of astrocytes that had activation of the NR2 pathway. She then asked whether this influenced the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway in the astrocytes, and she used HMGCS1 as a marker, shown here in purple. And what she found was, whereas these cells were highly abundant in control or active lesions, these were reduced in the inactive lesions. And this is quantified here, looking at the proportion of GFAP positive cells that are HMGCS1 positive, and compared to control, fully remyelinated or active lesions, this was decreased in the inactive lesions. So similar to what we're seeing in the GFAP and RF2 mouse, we're able to associate poor remyelination with an increase in the NR2 pathway in astrocytes and a decrease in the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. But as a summary of what I've shown you today, we've discovered that astrocyte oligodendrocyte interaction regulates central nervous system remyelination, and they do this by supporting the survival of mature oligodendrocytes. We found that this requires a shutdown of the NRF2 pathway, which then allows the upregulation of the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. And importantly, this warrants further investigation into the impact of NRF2 and cholesterol pathway modulating drugs, which are currently being given to people with MS, uh, specifically in the context of remyelination. And interestingly, this also highlights both astrocytes and mature oligodendrocytes as important therapeutic targets for remyelination to complement current strategies which are targeting the progenitor cell differentiation. So hopefully you've had a chance to check out Irene's poster 121, but you can uh, find it on the website as well. And I'd like to uh, thank the people who did the work. So this is the lab and the work was done by a superb, a uh, super talented uh, trainee in the lab, Irene Molina Gonzalez. And uh, this was done in collaboration with the UK DRI, with Giles Hardingham and Sir Arthur Chandran, with Jill Fowler and Anna Williams at the University of Edinburgh, Tanya Coleman in Munster, and Jeffrey Johnson provided the GFAP and R2 mice. And this was funded by the UK MS Society, the MRC, and the Wacom Trust. So uh, if you have time, please check out the other lab's uh, posters. Uh, you just saw Rebecca's presentation, and Neve McNamara also has a poster on microglia regulation of myelin integrity. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks for coming. That was excellent. Very well done. Really interesting research approach, and uh, it seems like you have a lovely lab with very young, talented women. So well done, Veronique. I wanted to ask you about this cholesterol uh, pathway uh, targeting therapies. Um, you said some of those are already uh, tested in MS. Would you like to elaborate more on this point? So the first thing I'd like to mention is the statins. So these have been investigated in the context of MS for quite a while now. And uh, back when I was doing my PhD quite a while ago, I was investigating the impact of statins on remyelination. And the reason we're interested in this is that we knew that um, myelin is very rich in cholesterol and these are cholesterol inhibiting drugs. And we found that short term treatment with statins was beneficial in terms of differentiation of oligodendrocytes, but was actually detrimental in the long term, uh, causing poor remyelination in mice and also inducing human oligodendrocyte cell death in culture. Now, as an add-on to this, more recent work has looked at drugs that have been shown to enhance oligodendrocyte differentiation that are now in clinical trial. They found that these drugs tend to have off-target effects by influencing the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway, but they inhibit the pathway in the middle, at a very specific part of the pathway, and this causes accumulation of some of the intermediates in the pathway, so then it kind of stimulates the pathway by causing a buildup of some of these um, intermediates. And so it's interesting to show that it really depends at which part of the pathway you inhibit, uh, in that if you inhibit um, too low down and you're preventing cholesterol uh, biosynthesis, that it's deleterious. But if you can inhibit it earlier on, it could be beneficial. 
Very interesting. Thank you very much. If um, people have questions, you can they can use the link um, below, and then maybe you can answer even during the next talk. Thank you very much, Veronica. Excellent presentation. Thank you.